Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Jeff and Colin in the Morning, where we are your hosts, Colin Peters. And Jeff Manfred. Well, we were trying to have this episode out a while back, a little while back, but we said there was way too much information to talk about, and we didn't have enough time to research it properly. So today, Jeff and I will be talking about Tales from the Crypt. Honestly, like... I still feel like we could have done more weeks of um, just research because there's still a lot here, even with the show, the comics, the movie, the movies. And it just seems like um, that there was a lot of buildup for everything. And just even the comic itself was kind of a cool turnaround going from the like normal adventure stories to the dad dying. Was it Max Gaines? In a, mo- a boating accident. And yes, then, the dad. Yeah. And um, then the son should... taking it over and uh, turning it into this whole horror realm. And honestly, like, when I first watched the show when we were younger, I didn't realize it was this. I thought the comics were just made up for the show. I was just going to ask you, what was your first experience with Tales from the Crypt? Like, everything in general. Was it the show? Yeah. Because the show was for me. Um. No, I lie, actually. It was actually the original movie they did in, what, the 70s? Oh, really? Yeah. And... 72 or 73, I think? Yeah, which it had the uh, Crypt Keeper as a man instead of what we're used to. I didn't realize what it was at first. And then when I saw the show, my... And I was probably way too young to begin with. <laughs> but it's like, I remember watching that with my dad too. And it just kind of like one of those things that it started to click. And then I think I asked that question, is that in this together? Like I thought this was a precursor. <laughs> <laughs> when technically it was. Yeah. I mean, we see it often now where sometimes movies spawn TV shows where they usually flop or see like, um, I think one of the more popular like movies to shows that sometimes have like n- really similarities but not really connected tissue that come to my mind are uh mash the show mash it was originally a movie and then it became this long running tv show oh shit yeah you didn't know that i thought it was the other way around i thought the, sh- the movie i've never actually i'm not gonna lie i've never really watched the show like uh front to back so neither have i i've only seen like random things and then i saw there was a movie so i thought it was like the last hurrah was the movie but i was like that's actually really cool doing it that route. Yeah, I think the I'm pretty sure the movie came first. I don't have the pinpoint of the years exactly down, but I'm pretty sure the movie came first and then the TV show because I think the show like it, it made a big deal about the final episode and this long running thing, you know. But there were I think only Radar was the only original actor from the movie that went to the show. Okay. That would make sense. Like, you just have one character, and now you're going to have a whole crew come in and just, all right, so this is the one thing that ties over. Mm-hmm. And it was the same thing with Tales from the Crypt, with the, the movie and the show. There really was, like, no connective tissue. Hell, even the people who work behind the scenes to get this started was, like, a totally new generation. Pretty, basically, I mean... I don't want to give too much away. Well, I don't think it really matters. Yeah. It's more or less a discussion with the yeah. practice throughout it. <laughs> but famous producer Joel Silver, who worked with Richard Donner on movies like Lethal Weapon, maybe Goonies, I'm not sure. But I know Joel Silver has had a an amazing resume of work. He got Richard Donner and Robert Zemeckis you know, to be a part of making Tales from the Crypt and putting it in. It was actually supposed to be a movie again. Oh, really? Yeah, and then they decided to turn it into a show, and William M. Gaines, the creator of Tales from the Crypt, he actually had some input on the show and helped them out with the first pilot, and they said that the pilot was like the template for the rest of that series then. I mean, honestly, that that was the one of the few I remembered. Like When I started rewatching the series... Uh, it was I remember a lot of that first season, and when I got past that, it's when I saw, like I started seeing new episodes, and then I think it was around season five I started recognizing the episodes again. Yeah, they kind of were on repeat, just told a different way. It was like a well, reboot before a reboot. Not even that; it was just the episodes <laughs> I remember seeing before. Oh, okay, I got gotcha. you. Um, what the heck is it? the one with the ghouls and the fraternity? Yes, that was the one. I'm like, um, I like I feel like it's this season, and literally I started playing the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was funny 
I never watched the original Tales from the Crypt movie from 1972, but I found out that it was an anthology movie. It was the inspiration, actually, for George Romero and Stephen King to do Creep Show. Which would make sense. I could see that. Like, you have the Crypt Keeper being the, I guess, the bookend for everything, and then with the Creep being the bookend for, with, uh, wow, Tom Atkins and Stephen King's son, so. And they also had the comic book look to that, because they said they were fans. I think John Carpenter was also a fan of the Tales from the Crypt comic books. Um, He actually does the foreword in the, I guess, the reprint of the Tales from the Crypt comics, which is kind of a nice touch. He actually That's does incredible. talk about his love for it, what actually helped him realize he could do horror movies was part of that. I heard him say that it also influenced him to do The Fog because of the way the endings were. The endings were unique at the time where they were kind of like a comeuppance, like a just dessert for the people who did the wrong and you think they're going to get away, but really they they get it in the end. And oh it kind of keeps the bad guy at bay, but it just, yeah. It, it, Tales from the Crypt was... I think uh, William M. Gaines' uh, daughter was the one who said that she now takes over the property, I guess, or at least for the comic book property. And at the time, she said she didn't understand what it was, and she thought it was just kind of like the job that her dad did. And she said, looking back on it, my dad was a genius. He was a revolutionary with this stuff. And, yeah, I mean, it was it was unique at the time because there weren't horror comics. Um I'd say especially in 1947 when that really got going. So, a little bit of quick history. Tales from the Crypt was created by William N. Gaines. He was the first publisher in horror comics history. His father uh, created the first comic book, Famous Funnies, in 1934, and created the publishing company EC Comics, which stood for Education Comics. And then when sales were lacking... It was changed from education comics to entertaining comics. Uh, At one point, William joined the Army Air Corps, and then he briefly enrolled in NYU to be a teacher of all things. And then his dad was killed in a boating accident, I think, in 1947, and then William took over EC Comics. And the odd thing is they said that it was $100,000 in the red. It's when he got hold of everything and his dad was supposedly like very successful i think he did work with some of the other publishers in dc i don't think they were dc comics at the time but they knew wasn't it action comics yeah before they were dc they were action comics and they said his dad max was working with a lot of the publishers who did superman and some of the other more successful comics at that time so when they found out that his dad had all this debt and wasn't really successful with his own publishing company, it was very surprising, and William wanted nothing to do with it. But I forget if it was his mom who said he had to take over. We'd have to look into that, but again, like you know, they- we could have done days upon days of research, but this was just so fascinating. So after he takes over, he connects with an artist named Al Feldstein or Fein Feldstein Feldstein and he experimented with different uh safe ideas for a new direction and then I think the both of them or at least Feldstein said that he was listening to a radio show called Lights Out which inspired them to do horror. Oh wow. Which I don't know about you, but did you ever listen to the old radio shows? I know that they did all the the sound effects and everything, like, it really did build an atmosphere. But, no, I never actually did it. I just kind of, like, read into it because it does sound like a fascinating you, thing. You know about the Orson Welles story, right? Yeah, absolutely. With the War of the Worlds. <laughs> yeah. Some of those old radio shows, it's basically like a live audio book. Okay. Maybe just amplified a little bit because it adds some animation to it. And just kind of is like theater of the mind, you know? It's like, like you can hear your own pitches and tones of the way people talk in a book if it's not too specific but in the old radio shows they present it to you but it's still all in your head so the old radio oh, shows are really cool you have to check them out if you can that's such a really nice build up too like if you're just hearing them explain and talk and having all the noises to go with it it's kind of like what i say about a character like venom you don't really hear the two different voices in the comic book 
But when you watch Tom Hardy's Venom, you can decipher who's talking. It's not just Eddie Brock talking with the symbiote over him. It's actually Venom talking. And you can hear Venom talking to him when he's not covering the body. Which I think some people don't understand how unique and special that is in that movie. But, to continue, the show Lights Out on the Radio was the inspiration to do horror. So, by 1950, they found some success by doing these horror comics, and it was originally called Vault of Terror. And I think they had three different uh, comic book titles. Uh, Haunt of Fear, uh, Vault of Terror slash Horror, and then you also had Tales from the Crypt. And they were basically good versus evil stories with their just dessert twist endings, like I said. I remember watching a documentary where they talked about a, a father who had a meat business and he sold tainted meat. And he says, oh, four people died. We got to move out of town. And she goes, ah, I knew they were on to you. And, and he says, yeah, but people are dying, so we got to go now. It's not just that I sold them tainted meat. They're dying from it. And she goes, this is so bad. I knew this was so bad. And he goes, but I did it for you, honey. I did it for Junior. And she goes, Junior? He's already over at the neighbor's house. And he goes, oh, no, I sold them meat. And uh-huh. the kid comes back, and he's like, I feel sick. And then the kid dies, and then the wife takes the knife, and she's like, you killed our son. And he's like, honey, put that knife down. And the next thing you see is her in the meat shop with all his, like, body parts like in the meat selection and she's just chopping away going tainted meat tainted meat tainted meat." <laughs> you know it was stuff like that where you're following this character who's not really a hero but sometimes sometimes they're bad sometimes they're people who just want to break and you do kind of feel bad for them but it's like they sold their soul to the devil and this is the end result it's like you get what you want whether it's money power but it's for a limited time and it's not worth eternal damnation or the torture that you're gonna go through in the end so yeah there were some like moral messages there that were pretty cool uh the crypt keeper he was in in the comic the crypt keeper in the comics was actually inspired by witch's tale which was a comic and radio show that Um, the job of the Crypt Keeper was to provide humor. And there were three different uh, horror hosts, I guess, in these comic books. There was the Crypt Keeper, there was a witch that they had, and, oh man, I forget what the other one was. I feel like it was a ghoul. I think it's on one of the comics that you have there. Oh, they don't actually tell. They just got pictures. Oh, okay. That's what I was looking at real quick. Yeah, and the original crypt that's the original crypt keeper right there. He doesn't look like anything from the show. It's almost like an old wizard kind of. I'll provide oh. pictures <laughs> or like a, a wannabe 80s rock star that just aged out and didn't the age long well. Long white hair, yeah. <laughs> Bad bangs. <you> know? <laughs> it's like grandpa, you're not in a band anymore. <laughs> He's got that wizard cloak kind of monk like <laughs> you know look <laughs> that was the one thing i did notice throughout the comics each of those characters did always have a cloak so it was um if you didn't pay attention to the colors it wouldn't really like you wouldn't tell the difference it was kind of funny with that aspect I'm like all right so what is it red's the witch you got green and then which is the i guess the ghoul and then you've got <laughs> <laughs> the crypt keeper is uh blue blue yeah which kind of funny <laughs> Yeah. It's a comic book. They got to make colors pop. Oh, absolutely. But as you know, they're I'm sure they were scary back for their time. And looking at them they were and some of the art even then was pretty scary like melted and distorted faces from other artists. They were really revolutionary with that as well. But the job of like the, the witch and the ghoul and the crypt keeper were to pro- provide humor so that when people would read the stories they wouldn't just get scared they would be entertained and provide some levity at the end and go oh uh." (laughs) it almost like makes you go am i supposed to laugh at this (laughs) 100 percent, yes you just watch somebody get murdered you might as well just start laughing it might as well (laughs) oh it was the vault keeper crypt keeper vault keeper and an old witch that would explain why it's called the Vault of Horror. So, or there terror. we go. <laughs> I actually had this written down. I should have just read it. <laughs> eh, it makes for a better time. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> there we go. 
if anybody wants to do their own Tales from the Crypt comic ripoff, spinoff, and the Ghoul Keeper or whatever, <laughs> there, there you go. We gave you an idea. <laughs> Just remember us for royalty. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, but it was really cool because as the sales were, <laughs> no pun intended, gaining <laughs> for for them, and they were becoming financially successful with these comic books, they spawned. Uh, shot comics which were not in like the horror field they were a little different and then they also um shot comics actually were dealing with more like racism anti-semitism and moral messages they were like more grounded in morality okay and messages and meaning i mean but most of the stories in the like the tales from the crypt had some morals in them so yeah it's kind of like they already set the groundwork for it well these weren't these weren't like horror related. They were actually more serious. Okay. More like uh, there were stories about a soldier who went to war and when he comes back somebody saved his life, but they don't want to bury the guy who saved his life in the town because the guy who sacrificed himself for this specific soldier who survived was black. Oh. Yeah, and it was and he says this is like I'm ashamed. You know, like I fought for democracy over in another, in Vietnam or Korea, and the least you can do is have respect for the guy who saved me and not just view me as a hero, but view him as a hero. And I think there was another one where these aliens come to a planet where they see robots in orange and blue paint. And then I think at the end, the robots take off one of the robots takes off a helmet and it reveals a black person. And even though there was, I think they had something to do with prejudice, even just between like the orange and blue robots, it didn't matter what was underneath the actual robotic outfit. Oh, wow. Until the mask came off. Yeah. It was just to go to show that like, there's still prejudice no matter what, like it doesn't matter what you are underneath, but even on the outside, it can still be prejudice. And it was to, like, break away from that. And I remember they said that there was a comics code at the time that gave them a, a rough time about showing a black guy. And they said, but this is the message of the story. Yeah. Was to get over this. <laughs> and it was kind of like, you know, like that comics code. We'll get into more of that comics code soon. But the point of that comic code was to, like, get rid of delinquency and, like, protect kids and you know you know what i mean like instill better morals through these stories and here they were kind of like no you can't have that like what <laughs> <laughs> kind of defeating the purpose exactly of what... <laughs> oh my gosh and uh they actually spawned mad magazine okay they were the original it started as a comic book and then it became mad on its own merit at some point then i think mad was actually what saved them after this comic code stuff because the comic code, well, it, it's actually next on my list here. There was controversy in 1954 by a psychiatrist called Dr. Frederick Wortham. And I remember hearing this guy in a Batman documentary and Stan Lee had talked about I, him. I want to say a lot of comic uh, documentaries will touch base with him because that doctor um, pretty much did flip the whole comic world upside down because of like everything that he stated so there's a lot of changes that ended up happening because of it he created a book called seduction of the innocent and he blamed comics for bad behavior and the health of children he said horror and crime comics were a direct design for juvenile delinquency it led to comic book burnings bannings and political committees and then at the end of the day it basically resulted in this uh, code from an organization called the Comics Code Authority. I wasn't there actually like congressional hearings about this too. Like, That's what the committees were. Okay. Yeah, they I, had exactly. Because I remember ahead. the hearing about that too, and it, it just seems like it was kind of insane. Almost like how um, music in the '80s, where D. Snyder went up against uh, Tipper Gore for just that. So it's like it's the fact that it happens every so often. And comics just happened to be during the 50s. And... That's exactly what it was. It was the censorship of music of that time. And again, it goes back to the kids. You know, I remember Stan Lee even said that Dr. Wortham did a, 
a study on kids who read comics and this was their problem. And he said, but he also didn't realize that 90% of them drank milk too, but that didn't bother him. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, William H. Gaines, like, uh, William M. Gaines, sorry. Um, he was part of the committees and he was talking about like how he said, like, I don't really think these have anything to do with juvenile delinquency. And, Kind of like Dee Snyder did with um, John Denver and Frank Zappa during the music committees. But at one point he had to just give in and surrender the horror comic book stuff because I think it was hard for him to find anybody who would take him at that time. And that's where Mad Magazine pretty much kept the business afloat because they changed changed that. Let's say um, changed the business, format, yeah. Form, changed the format. And then... Tales from the Crypt, from at that point, was pretty much done until the movie came out in 1972. I'd say, honestly, I wish I would have done a little bit more research about that movie, because I'm wondering what led up to them actually doing it. Because it just seemed like it was, if that's what happened in 19, what, 1954, mm-hmm. and then it took almost, we'll say, 20 years before that movie even came out. It's like, so what was the buildup? Was it just a bunch of fans who wanted it and then went from there? That's what I'm curious about as well because I want to know like what brought it on. Although I think certain movies like Night of the Living Dead and, and horror in general were making us like a resurgence in theater. Like okay. He had the Universal Monsters and then Vincent Price and Peter Cushing films started coming in. Peter Cushing's actually in Tales from the Crypt. Maybe Joan Collins was in it as well. So they had some names in in this movie, and like we said, it was a precursor for Creep Show. I'd say a are, lot of the anthology series that we love. In general, it was yeah. Uh, I didn't watch this movie, but I was surprised to see that a lot of the stories that they took, I believe, were from comic books, and then they were taken from this movie and turned into episodes for the show then. I do remember the Santa Claus and the monkey's paw. The monkey's paw ended up changing to the three sisters in what season seven. Yes. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. I remember that was the last season because it was over in England. Yeah. We'll get on that one. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That's, that's, (laughs) but yeah, like we said, it, um, the movie, Pretty much inspired George A. Romero, Stephen King. Uh, John Carpenter said it influenced him to do The Fog because they were fans of Tales from the Crypt. And then in the late 70s, they did bring Tales from the Crypt back because there was a demand to say, hey, we'd like to read these comics again because the kids did love them. They they thought it was unique. It was different. They were scary. They found levity in the, the jokes that were there. And I remember George Romero said he was the typical kid like under the bed sheets with a flashlight or some sort of light reading them because it was kind of like, don't let your parents see this. And I think they reprinted old ones. I don't think they like just said, here's some new ones. They might've, I'd have to do more research on it, but I, I could swear they said that they did more of the um, reprints, like I said, and that's what kind of build up more of a resurgence to it. Which is a nice touch. You already have all these stories. Why not just uh, put them back out? And then if the, the demand is still there, why not move forward with some new stuff? Eventually, you got to, or else it just becomes stale. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like a music band, though. You might get some new ones, and they might not be the same, because now you're getting a different generation of writers as well that may not have that same touch or feel. It's kind of like, like we might get... Like, you might like a band from 30 years ago, and then they put out new music, and they've totally changed. Like, for example, you listen to Soundgarden, you know, they were, like, angry kids, you know, back in the day, and then they, like, really mellowed out. This doesn't mean it's not good music, but the totally different. (laughs) I mean, what are you going to be really angry about in your 50s? It's just... Now things change, your life changes, so yeah. Families, yeah. you're not like starving for money unless you're broke all the time. <laughs> Maybe you're jonesing on drugs, I could see that, but but that's my analogy. <laughs> <laughs> so after the resurgence and the influence, we got 
the 1980s that came by. And in the late 80s, as we said earlier, producer Joel Silver was a comic book fan. He reached out to William Gaines, said, hey, I'd like to do the rights and I'd like to uh, attain the rights and see if I can get a movie going. And then the movie wound up turning into a show instead. He got directors Richard Donner and Robert Zemeckis. Gaines was involved in the first episode, was used as a template, and that was pretty much what they did. And they took some inspiration from the comics, and the show ran from 1989 to 1996. Which, honestly, like if you're going, to, that's a good span, even for a show, even if it's just an anthology. So there was nothing that led episode to episode. It wasn't... Like, all right, so we know the Crypt Keeper's going to do this in the next episode. No, it was just drawn at random at what uh, story they were going to do next. And it was a nice touch because, like, it was just in and out in, like, 20 minutes and just something funny. You knew a twist was going to come. Um, even rewatching it, I was trying to figure out the twist before it happened. <laughs> and it was like, that was a, a oh, funny thing. Like, after watching, like, several seasons, it's like, I got to the point where I'm like, all right, this is going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like I said, at some point in the show, I, I want to say it was after season four. It looked like a lot of the shows were kind of wash, rinse, repeat. Like there they... was a lot of similar um, themes after a while. I think season five, six, and seven had that because it's like, if you do look at the uh, Tales from the Crick comics and Vault of Horror and them, they all did have the same themes, but it just was either revenge, adultery, um, shitty people, and it just kind of over time financial yeah. gains, you know. So it's like you could see that there was some definite repeats after a while. Yeah, the, uh, heavily based on a like '90s drama at that time as well. I noticed, like, if you watch some of those '90s drama films or like crime drama or something, it was there was some strong influence from that as well. But HBO was the before HBO was you know, Max or HBO Max or whatever, and streaming was a thing, you had to pay for HBO and you were able to get movies at home. But it wasn't like, there was like a time for movies to be on TV. Yeah, because yeah. originally HBO was a uh, home box office. So. That's exactly what it what it was. It, it was just the movies are at home. But you had to go through a guide and say, like, oh, Batman Returns was going to be on at 8 o'clock tonight. Or Beetlejuice was going to be on at, you know, six or something, you know, it, and that's how you got to watch things. And Tales from the Crypt fell into a time slot. I don't know when exactly it aired. I, I feel like between yeah. the nine and 11, like one, between that out two hour span there, because I'm like, after a certain amount of time, kids were always a, supposed to be in bed. So they'd play like the more kind of, we'll say fucked up things. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, again, just like, the comic was revolutionary the show was a bit revolutionary because it was a tv show that was uncensored it, which we were so accustomed to tv and its censorship and how you, you you can't say this you can't say that you can't show this you can't show that but it it, it allowed violence and sexuality to be shown on the show and it gave adults something to be entertained about it also gave them as kids to be adult and be like oh wow this is like comic books come to life kind of like how we view comic book movies now or something where it's live action and we go yeah we, that, that's really awesome it looks like this is coming straight from the pages and the crypt keeper became a character in itself and a bit of a horror icon i know he was i want to say definitely in the 90s you could see he was everywhere <laughs> Like how Elvira was and Pee Wee Herman, and it just seemed to be like one of those things. Like he blew up. Just I think it was because of his voice and how smart ass he really was. It was an animatronic puppet that looked like a decaying zombie in a way. And then there's actually an episode where you see how the Crypt Keeper came to be. <laughs> it's like from um, Freak Show Carnies. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's actually really cool that they, like, it was a spin and a twist that you didn't expect in that episode. And it was a puppet. It was, um, it, it was kind of like a Swedish chef puppet where the hands and the arms were actual people and the mouth and the eyes and the head were controlled by people outside or remote control. I think it said that it took five people to control it. Okay. So like you got eyes, 
mouth. I think there's one for even just the regular facial expression, like the eyebrows. And then you had the hands. And then um, the person who designed it actually did the stuff for Child's Play and Friday 13th Part 4. So if you look at his eyes, you can definitely tell those are Chucky's eyes. Ah. Because they, they said the blue eyes. And I'm looking at it. It wasn't until I read that I had to go back and look. I'm like, oh, shit, that is actually really fucking cool. I believe Kevin Yeager from the... He's known for um, picking up the Nightmare on Elm Street makeup. I think he even worked on Tales from the Crypt, too. Did he do... Was it three, four, and five? Uh, two, or three, two. and four. Four, I that, think. Yeah, that's the same guy. Okay. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but yeah, it was kind of cool because I, I knew he did Nightmare on Elm Street, but it was uh, Friday Thirteenth and Child's Play that stuck out to me a little okay. bit more because it was, I guess, the whole animatronics were what actually with that whole situation, like uh, with Jason get his head chopped and the animatronic falling down the blade, is what gave them the idea to do use him for. So he worked with Tom Savini too, because Tom Savini did work on friday the 13th floor because remember it was like he he created the monster and i guess they kill it mm-hmm. yeah and it, it's kind of cool like the horror world scene connective that, tissue yeah. yeah it's like how greg nicotero is oh part of this part of that part of everything it's like I, six degrees of kevin bacon except six degrees of uh greg nicotero <laughs> dude that guy has been in damn near everything and it's just it's, it's starting with george romero and is kind of a really cool concept. The fact that, like, oh, you want a job? Here you go. Yeah. I'll work with Tom Savini. <laughs> <laughs> and then, lo and behold, <laughs> this, like, tree branch of horror. <laughs> oh, my gosh. that That's fantastic, though. It's so cool. And the show itself, like, I don't know if people were just fans of the show, but they had so many popular actors at that time and celebrities that were a part of this show. Well, that's originally what they wanted to do with the show. They were trying to keep it low budget, but yet try to bring new directors, actors, and writers forward so that they could, you know, get the stories out there, have someone have a little bit of airtime. I think, but you also had Arnold, who ended up directing three episodes. I know one for sure. And there's three all together, which I found out. I found out Tom Hanks did, I think, two. Yes. I think he was actually in one, wasn't he? Yeah, he was in one. Michael J. Fox directed one, and he I, had a cameo in it yeah. as well. That one actually was like really funny, because I wasn't expecting Michael J. Fox to be in it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, directed by him. I'm like, cool. And then all of a sudden he's in it. I'm like, oh, oh, shit. <laughs> there were so many other people. Like Demi Moore was in the show, Katie Segal, Christopher Reeve, uh, Judd Nelson, Steve Buscemi, Ernie Hudson. Tim Curry played like three characters yeah, in one episode. Yeah, a mom, episode. dad, and daughter. John Stamos, John Lithgow, Catherine O'Hara, Eddie Izzer, Ewan McGregor, Leah Thompson, and I think Patricia Arquette. There's like so many famous people that were in the show. William Freakin directed an episode. William Freakin, the director of The Exorcist. Yeah. He directed an episode. Toby Hooper, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Tom Holland, who did Child's Play and Gremlins. Yeah. Wait, did he do? Did I'm, Tom Holland do Gremlins? I don't know, but I know. No, 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 no. Friday I don't. Night. Th- <laughs> yeah, Fright Night. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, no, I, I forget who did Gremlins. Maybe that was... I don't Joe John Tan. Je- that's it. Yeah, thank you. Didn't he actually do an episode? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? He might have. <laughs> but it was kind of cool. Like, after a while, I want to say around season four, like, even with, like, all the, I guess, celebrities they had throughout it, it just seemed like one, uh, several seasons in, they started actually, I guess the popularity went up, so they were able to get more celebrities in it. So it's like they had a lot more bigger names for, I want to say, like, three or four seasons, which was kind of like crazy. Because it got to the point where I'm just like, oh, they're in the... <laughs> it was almost like a modern-day 60s Batman, where the villains were, like, special guest actors or something. And people that were celebrities at that time were, like, the Batman villains. You know, they got big names to either direct or be in or both. It was like wow, I didn't realize this show was actually that much of a big deal or they loved it that much where they just said, yeah, I want to be a part of this. Which is really cool. Like, you wouldn't think that something, I guess, based in the horror would get that popular. And it, it did. It it was everywhere. And HBO was not like it is now. I don't think it really took off until... Oh, what would you say, like the late 90s or early 2000s? Whenever Sopranos and Sex in the City were really popular, that's when it started really becoming a a thing. And I think people were getting their own personal satellite dishes or yeah. uh, 
cable boxes to allow more pay pay channels and packages and i think that's how these shows got more noticed but yeah i mean it it surprises me because i remember um during like my competition days that whenever we'd go to hotels you obviously would have free hbo there so it was exciting you know we were hell yeah young to you know so young and we were like yo we get free hbo <laughs> that was that was a typical thing for like even adults oh we get free hbo here <laughs> it was like a joke you know you, you probably find some old movies where people will say that oh you get free hbo I, there's a couple of hotels that still say that. <laughs> i'm like hell yeah <laughs> and um i remember watching some tales from the crypt even then and my parents, I don't even think they really cared. <laughs> I mean, like, even if you wa- look at it, like, it really wasn't bad. Like, even the horror wasn't really horror. It was a quick, like, jolt. Yeah, it was so campy and over the top with stuff that you really couldn't take it serious. I mean, it was, there really wasn't anything, like you said, that was scary with it. I mean, it were horror ideas, but the point of the show was to be entertaining, kind of like, like 60s Batman it was it it could appeal to kids but it also made the adults laugh and here we're going from a generation where the adults who read the comics are now the kids and now they're watching this and it's almost like hey you want to watch this with me i mean if parents didn't mind because yeah. it's you know content <laughs> but <laughs> but i mean i think the help was also the crypt keeper and how they were turning him into a character of itself i feel like the crypt keeper wouldn't have been who he was if it wasn't for his voice and i think i'm gonna butcher his last name john kazir yep if john (laughs) kazir wasn't the voice actor for it i don't think it would have worked out because that laugh the way he delivered those puns was fantastic like it's just the way he would open it and close an episode. Hey, some people just have that magic. You know, like Robert Englund, Freddy Krueger, Boris Karloff, Frankenstein's monster, Bela Lugosi, Dracula. There's a reason why we remember them. It's not just their performance, but it's also the combination in their performance of how they deliver lines, how they present themselves the pageantry and john kazir just like it's just a staple where he did sound a little different at the time in the beginning and i think it had something to do with the budget yeah it's not he's on a grittier and a little toned down so like a little more serious i think also they were in a hurry to like film things because it was so low budget in the beginning and I think that played a part. I remember hearing him in an interview talk about it, and he explained why. And then they started expanding the intros and the outros for him. Which you could tell. like It was worth every moment, too. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. I also found out that some of the guys who worked on Freddy's Nightmares, the Nightmare on Elm Street TV series, when that show got canceled, they went over to Tales from the Crypt, and they were able to help out with budgeting and it think that helped keep tales from the crypt afloat and make it more successful which is kind of cool like that i think what freddy's nightmare was essentially the same thing just it, freddy basically yeah and basic freddy was basically the crypt keeper at that time telling these stories with these twist endings that were very similar to this i'm not gonna go watch that never mind i was looking, sitting there going maybe i'll go rewatch that i actually have been and some of them are rough and some others are not so bad I gotta say, like, I what influenced me to talk about this show was I went back and rewatched it, and I was actually looking for something that had an ending similar to it. Turns out it was The Howling. It wasn't. Oh a, it, shit! Yeah, and um, it wasn't a Tales from the Crypt episode, but I was watching the whole series, and while I didn't find that ending or know what the hell it was. I was just so entertained and I just kept on wanting to watch more Tales from the Crypt. I wanted to watch more Crypt Keeper and I loved watching them in order. I loved seeing the stories. And then when they started becoming wash, rinse, and repeat, I was like, okay, it's still fun. It's still entertaining. But I also found it 
so much fun that it helped you get into the Halloween horror spirit. It wasn't really scary. Like, I think anybody who doesn't like horror and scary stuff can totally watch this. And especially now with people who love crime dramas or those, like, true crime tv shows or something i think in some ways they could kind of like tales from the crypt honestly i feel like even now because of how um documentaries about true crime are fucking everywhere and like really popular that they could bring this show back um but 100 i feel like it would have to be in the style like how greg nicotero is doing with creep show it make it literally um in an hour episode you can do two 25 minute or half hour episodes and do it as a whole that's the other nice thing about tales from the crypt these episodes are tight like, yeah I th- are they i think they only are 25 to 30 minutes and they tell a story that flow from beginning to end and you get just enough to go okay like you you beginning middle and end and they just flow i don't think there was ever a to be continued no they're wasn't anything like you said that connected anything it was just here's a story here's how it ends and that's it (laughs) but would you really want it to be continued on who murdered who or who's fucking who and literally you know it's someone's gonna fucking die that's what it's gonna (laughs) be i could see especially now where we live in the age of crossovers where as somebody who just went nuts instead of died was in an episode and it's like oh i remember that guy from this episode but I do think it was a nice touch when they brought back the dude from the first episode who was the, elect- the uh, executioner. Was it? I forget his name off the top of my head. And brought him into the movie with Billy Zane. And I thought that was a really nice touch to be like, oh, shit. These two, more from the most, like, some of the popular episodes where we used those actors. <laughs> yeah. Now, there were, what, three movies? There were three. Uh, I've never actually watched the third one. I just found out about it recently. Like, yeah, um, the three based off of the TV show, we should say. Yeah. Because there was the original one from the 70s. I could be wrong, but there might have been a sequel to the one from the 70s. I might look into that. That might be another thing. Like, it, That might be another episode by itself, just seeing that universe. Oh, yeah. I mean, like this episode, obviously, is just oh, Tales from the Crypt yeah. in general. <laughs> you know, it's not just the show or the movie Umbrella. I mean... I felt like we wouldn't be doing it justice if we just no, did that. I feel like it, it. there's too much. If we were just like, all right, we're going to stick to just the show. <laughs> no, man. There's, there's The show was what everyone knows. There's a lot to the beginning and, the I guess, the end of the show. but <laughs> And how revolutionary it was. Yeah. And even like you're, like you're saying about like you, you wanting to do this because you rewatched the show and then... The fact that you rot, you rewatched it yeah. again after you heard me talking about it, and you're I, like, "This show's actually really good." It was funny. It was, uh, I want to say, Labor Day weekend, or Memorial weekend. We're back in May. Um, I was gonna buy the seasons, and then I just happened to clean out my shed. I had the first four seasons just chilling out there, and I'm like, "Well, the horror gods were like, here you go, <laughs> bud. There's your fucking sign, man." <laughs> Hell, I think a couple of years ago, back at your old place, I remember you um, having them then, and we watched them a little bit. Like, I remember, I didn't remember, I vaguely remember the Christmas one with Mary Ellen Trainer, who was like the mom and everything in the 80s. Oh my god, yeah. And I think she was Robert Zemeckis' wife. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, it, it made me laugh, because Christopher Reeve was in it, and I was like, Christopher Reeve was in an episode? But then I remember Richard Donner works on Tales from the Crypt, Superman, so... I was like, okay, now makes this sense. makes sense. You know, Michael J. Fox, Robert Zemeckis worked, was the director on Back to the Future, so I could see the connection there. You know, shit like that. Yeah. Um, but I do remember the Leah Thompson one. where Listen, she Leah w- Thompson was one of those hot women from the 80s that even now she still looks very attractive. But I she was like, does look good, yet. And I'm like, that was one of those things. Like, I she played the hot girl, and I'm like, yeah. that's who she was. I mean, even in Howard the Duck, she was the hot yeah. girl. Okay, <laughs> the fucking duck movie. Right? <laughs> it's so funny because she looks better now than what she did with the Mom McFly makeup. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Back Dude, to the I feel bad for everybody who had to wear that the Back to the Future old person makeup <laughs> because now they look, they don't look anything like that old person. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, even look at Christopher Lloyd. He doesn't even look 
that bad at what eighty? Yeah, and it's like his old makeup made him look worse. <laughs> <laughs> No, Crispin Glover doesn't even really look like he aged. Yeah, him. he still looks like he it from fucking Friday the 13th, yeah. all right? <laughs> so, going back to the movies, we had what? Demon Knight, Bordello, Bordello of Blood, and Rival. R- Rival? Yeah, it's with Jennifer Grey. Yeah, from Dirty Dancing. Yeah. I heard it was so bad, though. I was going to buy it because I can't find it. And then I'm like, ah, I'll see if I can find something somewhere because I'm like, I remember I didn't. I just watched Demon Knight for the first time. I remember watching Business and Pieces when I was younger, but didn't really appeal to me until I watched it recently. And I'm like, yo, this is actually on point. Like the story's good, the acting's really good, even the um, demons are really well made up. I'm like, oh shit, how did I miss this boat? <laughs> I have to go back and give it a chance because I watched the trailer and i was like okay this looks pretty entertaining you know i'll definitely give it a chance it's tales from the crypt you know billy zane was also in the show so i was like i'm it has me curious and i remember seeing it advertised for the longest time but for some reason i always remembered bordello of blood more it was on comedy central fucking almost every week (laughs) yeah that it was but we're what hell early teenagers probably yeah so titties and funniness that's all it was <laughs> Corey feldman and dennis oh miller God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um bordello of blood <laughs> like they were vampires that were just killing, killing customers i'm killing johns i guess <laughs> best way to get rid of bodies right <laughs> it was entertaining but it i oh. mean it was okay um but the funny thing is like uh i was at zombie fest and it actually played that sunday night and i'm wish i was thinking about going back just to watch <laughs> demon night <laughs> but it, it was like I, the first time i saw the trailer was when i was watching um army of darkness they played it first and i was laughing because i'm like it opens oh, up at mahoning driving yeah they played demon night trailer yeah well they Get actually out. played demon night at the end of uh zombie fest oh okay and I was like, that's what I was saying. I was half tempted to go back up just to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was watching the trailer, I'm like, yo, this actually looks really good. I was like, all right, I'll finish the show and then I'll watch that movie. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was cool because, like, the way they set it up was that uh, the Crypt Keeper was directing a movie. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and, like, even in the movie, that's how it starts out. It's, like, cheesy acting. It's, like, horrible, horrible acting. Like, tits everywhere. And then it actually kicks into the movie. <laughs> Because the, the Crypt Keeper is uh, talking shit on the actors and everything. <laughs> oh, jeez. I, I I should give it a chance. I mean, it definitely sounds interesting. And it did look pretty entertaining, to say the least, with it. So I'm willing to definitely give it a chance. I mean, I obviously, I, I love the show. I can't speak enough good things about it. Except for towards the end. And didn't you say that at one point there were, like, a rights issue? Um, That's actually now. Oh, that's why now. it's nowhere. Okay. But the reason they did uh, season seven in England was the same concept. It wasn't actually to save money. It was because they wanted to reinvent themselves with a whole new set of writers, directors, actors, so that they can continue because I felt they felt like it was getting stale. So I'm like, but in reality, ended up just shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah, season seven was... <sighs> I just remember watching it and going this is by far the worst season out of all of them and i think what eddie izzard's episode was probably the best one i agree i remember the one with ewan mcgregor was weird you didn't the like, zombie you, vampires the, yeah there were zombie vampires you didn't you didn't know what they were it wasn't explained it was just all over the place but the eddie izzard one was interesting because it was like detective it was like a true crime episode and it was psychological. I, I, it was really good. It was, it was really good. But like you said, the monkey paw one, and there was, wasn't there another one where there was a murder in Buckingham Palace or yeah. something like that? Oh, it was. Yeah, they were just weird and bad. And then the very last episode was Three Little Pigs. Three Little Pigs as an animated cartoon, and I. It, it was violent, and, and you're watching it going, okay, they made a violent tale a violent take on this tale but no it, no i just remember going this is how it ends yeah i think even uh was it the crib keeper was talking about the change of posit like a change of area just because it's like 
Oh, I got old. I got tired of the old place. <laughs> now we're the the, the, terror, the Tower of London in the basement or whatever. Funny thing was, speaking of sixties Batman, I remember in their last season they went to England. Had even it had like seems a, like a theme. <laughs> and it felt like that's kind of when they really shot themselves in the foot. <laughs> oh. But even ba- uh, even when they did the movies, technically. Uh, from Dust Till Dawn was originally supposed to be the follow-up to uh, Demon Knight. Oh, no shit. But I guess the whole rights thing happened, and Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez decided to take their story and then just make a movie out of it. Which I think it, like, that that's actually a solid movie, too. Oh, from du- I love From Dust Till Dawn. It would have been a better follow-up than Bordello of Blood, but now, after I've read that, now I understood why they went with Bordello of Blood. Same concept, but on a uh, lower scale? Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I'm like, it would have there because originally it was supposed to be a trilogy of Tales from the Crypt movies. We got that trilogy, but one being uh, on par, the other two just kind of falling off. Yeah. And if they would have had to follow up with like From Dust Till Dawn and then whatever was supposed to be the third one in the original trilogy, it probably would have done a lot better. Probably. Because even now, I, I feel like they could probably still just do movies, like one off movies of same thing. I think at one point. <sighs> There was a New Year's Eve special on Sci-Fi or Shudder or something where they brought the Crypt Keeper back and they made a big deal about it. And oh, John, John Kazir did the voice again. And I'll tell you what, John Kazir still seems like he's as popular as ever because I mean, we, we saw him at um, Monster Mania Con in Oaks, Pennsylvania, and his line was, like, throughout the whole day, just consistent, steady. Like, I think the only time it... There, nobody was there was when he had to take a break. <laughs> I mean, even when I saw him back in March, when in uh, Hunts Valley, his line was, he was like one of the steadiest ones there. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm not going to meet you today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm really happy for him. I think that's great, you know, for an actor to also be somebody where you n- never saw his face except for one episode. He actually is in an episode with like what, Great Robbers, I think. Yeah, it's like a con artist, and it was actually pretty funny, because even at the end of the episode, the Crypt Keeper makes a comment. He goes, man, this actor stands out. I don't know what it is. He actually pauses the episode, and he just yeah. kind of turns towards the screen. I'm like... <laughs> I remember it, because I saw that John Kazir's name was in the, the titles as an actor, and I was like, oh, here we go. And I, I just knew something was going to be said, and it was it was great. I'm happy they did that, and I'm happy for John Kazir, because he should get that credibility for it because you know i mean he the voice is basically the the life of that character oh absolutely like wasn't there also an animated yeah it went TV for three show? seasons and it was the tales of the crypt keeper same thing but it was toned down for kids um and the crypt keeper was more or less just a storyteller at that moment um actually amazon has all three seasons i've been watching it randomly just because it's um uh, I was curious. And Can it's Theo like, watch them? Yeah. Oh, really? So they're not that bad? No. Oh, it's wow. It's the same thing. It's all about morals. These, like, yeah, it's some some shitty person gets it in the end. <laughs> but it just, like, it could be uh, a folklore. It could have been whatever. And then it just kind of works its way into correcting itself. Um, nice. What the heck is it? I didn't realize it existed. Uh, until I was doing like those mystery boxes for like horror oh. and I got a DVD in there and it was only like three episodes I watched them I'm like oh that's pretty cool I didn't realize it was a tie into the show and I'm like cool and then when I found out that Amazon had them I started just watching them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like it with it being more kid friendly it you can't really watch them like back to back to back like you could with the other ones so it's like alright cool I can watch like one or two episodes and they just I'm good yeah and I think I think it's like 60 episodes or something like that something crazy for a kids show at the, for three seasons that sounds about right I don't really think they'd hammer animated out that much yeah. and what's really cool too is you can find Crypt Keeper merchandise all over the place and he's sort of become the face of Tales from the Crypt you yeah. know, it's not just the comic book anymore and that's the Crypt Keeper that we pretty much know now it's not the old, you know, three people, you know, that were originally the horror hosts in the comics anymore. 
the Crypt Keeper from the show is the face of the Tales from the Crypt franchise umbrella in general. Oh, absolutely. It's like, you can just, you as soon as you see him, you know what it is. Well, even the titles are different. You, like, you see Tales from the Crypt, and the, like, Tales is big, from the is a little smaller, and Crypt is, are these big letters, and they have that, like, drippy kind of, like, like green slime green slime just like oozing sort of look and you, you just go ah you know it you know you recognize it instantly yeah which is really cool because you have something now that grabs your attention it's like when you see a spider-man comic and you see the webbing kind of lettering that it has that's more signature you go oh it's a spider-man comic or something like that too I think that's it's really neat that they have all this imagery that just stands out where, say, like, you want to put it on some piece of merch or use it as a decoration. It just pops out, and that's what it is. Just like how the Crypt Keeper is now the face of the Tales from the Crypt. And honestly, I don't think I could see anything else being, you know, the figurehead anymore. Because it's like, that, that it goes synonymous with that name. So, like, even if they tried to, let's say, reinvent it, you're going to end up using some sort of Crypt Keeper. Even if it is not our version, it just might be an updated version to it. Yeah. I could see somebody maybe somewhere down the line doing something like the old-fashioned comic book stuff, keep it nostalgia, and just say, this is all it is. It's just nostalgia, and we're doing it because it wasn't done before. Because, I, I mean, the Crypt Keeper's, like, way too popular to, oh, yeah. to ever try to top him or replace him. So, that's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even if we just get one more movie at this moment, it would be actually pretty fun. A TV movie, or if Max would actually say, here's an anniversary thing or something, just to, like, for old time's sake. Oh, absolutely. Make a big deal about it for Halloween, or even have a almost like an elvira thing where he actually does host movies in public domain or something that oh would, dude that'd be perfect or do it with elvira just to something fun to be like elvira and the crypt keeper you know like imagine those whips <laughs> oh my gosh dude they wouldn't even have to play a movie it would just be them going back and forth the whole time <laughs> <laughs> i'd watch it i would <laughs> cool. you have anything else to add to tales from the crypt Actually, no. We covered a lot, and like I feel like we could have covered more, but like you said, just trying to do an umbrella, because even if we do move forward and do like an episode on itself. I think we should. I think this was the right thing to talk about, because I don't think a lot of people are too aware of the history behind the comics and the creator, William M. Gaines. I mean, it's a fascinating history, and that's why originally it was just going to be the show we were going to talk about, but then when I was doing research and then seeing how it started from the from the comics and then the movie and then the history of the comics and how it inspired filmmakers like George A. Romero and John Carpenter and how they said they were kids and didn't find anything bad in reading these comics that made them violent. If anything, it made them enhance their careers. You know, I'm sure there were probably some people out there like how we had people in Columbine supposedly claim they listened to Marilyn Manson and it made them snap but or like back in the day people said like acdc and judas priest did the same thing and uh, i mean i'm not here to psychoanalyze it but it just seems more like mental illness than anything just could just be their flavor of music or something that they read or they could have had inspiration behind it for sure but i mean the news and people actually committing these crimes before any of this I mean some of this was basically inspired by you know real life events like how often have we actually heard of like a butcher that actually you know took people and were killing them and you know and using like well didn't um what's his name John Wayne Gacy then like he take people and cook them and then like feed them to other people too or something I I know there's I know there's a serial killer out there who did that I I can't remember his name off the top of my head but yeah there is some inspiration for certain things so like I don't think everything from comics or music (laughs) and horror movies you know is like the sole inspiration I think there are just some sick people out there and you know sometimes these writers and stuff will take it from the actual events and be like oh yeah this will make a great comic book or a great movie you know yeah i mean 
mean, we we've, we've gotten how many movies now inspired by a Gein, So, oh my goodness, more than <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anybody can count. Exactly. <laughs> It's not like Tales from the Crypt inspired it. A true story from a sick fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I can't recommend the show enough, actually. Especially if you have a Halloween party or you want to get into a Halloween spirit. You can put that show on and it just entertain the hell out of you. As oh, far hell as, yeah. As far as I'm concerned. You know, it's not really scary. It has some moments where it can be, but it's also, like, very psychological. It can have, like, those, like, crazy magic things in there that you know will just be pure entertainment. And then there's a mix of true crime drama. It, it's... They, they do keep it... They do keep it interesting. It's not some steady consistency thing, but after season four, you can tell it, it did get repetitive with... It was kind of like they said, well, this worked. Why don't we do it now again this way or something like that? Like, oh, we're going to try to revamp it just enough that it's a new story, but it's not a new story. <laughs> yeah. It's just told, It's like I said, it's a reboot before a reboot. <laughs> <laughs> just told in a different way. <laughs> but I, I've really enjoyed Tales from the Crypt. I don't mind rewatching them again. Um, I'll have to give Demon Knight a try. I haven't watched that. So... Yeah, I mean Jeff and I we recommend it. Oh hell yeah! I mean we we were we were so pumped when we were doing the research on this, and he was pumped when I said, "Yo, I was rewatching Tales from the Crypt, and here I got him." And I, we were getting the messages, John and I, going, "Yo, hey, Tales from the Crypt is really good. I forgot how good this show was, and it's just entertainment. That's yeah. all it is. I mean, could it get an Emmy? Like I don't." I don't know how awards <laughs> qualify anything anymore, and what do they really mean anyway? I mean, look, John Kazir, nobody can really put a face to the name, but guess what? When he's at conventions, people go because they say, hey, he's the Crypt Keeper. Oh, hell yeah. So it obviously goes to show that he's still making an impact after, was it 30 years now? Going on 30 years? Maybe, man. So, uh, probably more than 30, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit. What, 36? 37? Where are we, where are we at? 30, no, 35. Okay, yeah, there you go. Uh, uh, math. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is why we're an entertainment show, we're not scientists. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you have to say about Tales from the Crypt? Honestly, like you said, I could not suggest it enough. It was fun. Uh, realizing how many episodes I've seen from that first season was what really caught me off guard. And like one of my favorites is in the first season. It's the... Uh, freak show that has the nine lives and ends up realizing he doesn't have the ninth life <laughs> joey joe pantaleano i think was in that yep so another another big name and then um the santa claus one is one that always gets me because it's like um remembering from the movie i always mix up the movie and that episode because it's like yes they're very similar but there's just enough of a change that you're like oh shit i thought this was gonna happen next <laughs> but the little girl in it going i'll help you say and i'm like no fucking no yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i remember thinking i felt bad for some of the people with the twist endings and stuff but then i was like no they were looking back on just yeah, they, they all they all had it coming yeah some of them really did make you go like oh wow like uh the one with leah thompson where she you know she wanted to stay young and beautiful forever and she went to like a pawn shop or something and here he was like doing voodoo yeah. stuff because his wife died and he wanted to preserve her body so somehow he was taking youth from other women and it was like at feeding her body or something like that through these molds of their faces it was it was interesting it was like wild shit and i i thought it was cool it was something new it was something different it was like wow like yeah show me more stuff like this <laughs> yeah like it and it was neat like them trying to hide just enough so you can do the bigger reel at the end and that was a nice touch yeah some of them like i like the ghost stories more like they were kind of like ghost stories like the leah thompson one and some of the more spiritual and magic stuff the true crime stuff's cool but it is like a little more based in reality but I, obviously i like the horror fantasy of it because oh, i want to yeah. be entertained i want to see special effects and makeup and other stuff like that but they had a good combo where i think it could span to this audience and that audience and 
that also speaks volumes on its success because it didn't just stick to one particular formula. It appealed to this horror fan or that horror fan. And then, um, honestly, I feel like the one episode that I felt the villain was justified was the executioner because he was doing his job, even though he got fired for people that were just getting way off of a technicality. But then still doing it in a way that looked like an accident. And wasn't that William Sadler? Yes. From I, Die Hard 2 and Death. He was Death in uh, Bill and Ted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think Death does show up. and uh, He does. Yeah, yeah. he's and with the Crypt Keeper. They do a game. Uh, aren't they doing like rock, paper, scissors or something along the... <laughs> cutting off body parts? <laughs> I couldn't remember his name off the, off the top of my head. And, like, we just, and I'm like, all I could think of was Death. <laughs> But yeah, I, that's why I thought it was cool when he was almost the star of Demon Knight and then followed with Billy Zane. And like going from that episode to playing Death in the later season to the movie was a nice jump. <laughs> but yeah, he was the only one out of, I don't want to say all the episodes, I felt like he was the only anti-hero in it that actually was justified, but yet he still was doing fucked up shit. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> But yeah, I would say definitely check it out. Like if you, if you're just finding out about this show for the first time, where the fuck have you been? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what? How old are you? <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you're not and you haven't watched in a while, go back find it. You can probably find the complete series for like cheap right now. I think it's like forty bucks. If and I'm like that's seven seasons, so worth it. <laughs> also, um, check out our friend Jen Harding's artwork because she has done commission work of the Crypt Keeper and they are really cool and all her stuff is hand drawn so they're not printed so you'll get a legit hand drawn one of a kind you know Crypt Keeper if you want something from her. She also does others but I remember the Crypt Keeper was like a specific one because it's not like there's a whole lot of Crypt Keeper drawings you know wow. so it's it's more special if you reach out to her for it. I would say and if you want to meet her, she's actually going to be in Oaks in November, so at Monster Mania. So there's an opportunity there too. And her and her artwork will be there as well. I go because I I think I have like four pieces. I think four pieces of hers. I know two that are hanging up right now. <laughs> yeah, we got a couple, and uh, we actually have gotten her stuff as a gift, and we were able to get her work for my woman's <laughs> brother's <laughs> van gozer <laughs> oh yeah dude i fell in love with them <laughs> <laughs> i know <laughs> which they appreciate by the way <laughs> gozer is a band in upstate new york that we like to support and they support us as well as well as jen harding so we like to show our support and you can see jen harding's art on gozer's album yeah that, i think that's actually originally at war i was like oh shit and she kept just talking about it i'm like and i'm like I put two and two together. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so, yeah, we recommend uh, check out Gozer. They're a kick-ass band. Check out Jen Harding if you want some, you know, one-of-a-kind art pieces. And you can find some Crypt Keeper and Tales from the Crypt stuff from her. Or she'll even, she'll even take commission work if you want. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know where to find us, so we're, we're around. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, don't be afraid to send us messages. <laughs> yeah. We'll we'll talk your ear off with music and movies and horror or comics or whatever. <laughs> I spend almost eight hours a day doing it because it's like if I'm working, I need something to distract my head, mind and I'll just start talking movies. I grew up in the performing arts, so it's just in my blood. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does actually make people funny. It, like it makes people laugh because they'll see me like fixing something and I'm like inst my brain's just already doing something else like talking about I was getting somebody going on how Pulp Fiction is a bad movie just because I wanted to get a rise out of them uh, you're not going to get a rise out of me with that I don't know it's already starting <laughs> I just know you exactly <laughs> You'll, you'll nitpick over stuff just to try to annoy people. So oh, like, yeah, dude. I'll find the one thing that will drive you nuts and then just make it such a big thing. <laughs> yeah, but I can also tell you about good things about Showgirls, and you'll be like, no, no, <laughs> no. So turnabout's fair play. Yeah, that's the trade-off. <laughs> and I got you to admit that Showgirls was better than some movie. <laughs> yeah, Death, Death Proof. Proof. <laughs> a Tarantino. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Which Touché. even I admit yeah. it was bad. Yeah. 
All right, shall we wrap this up? Oh, absolutely. Okie dokie. So that is our Tales from the Crypt episode. Uh, This is Colin Peters. And Jeff Manfred. Thank you all once again for listening. Stay safe. Stay crazy. Uh, Please, somebody help me. Oh, yeah.